Hello everyone and welcome back to Mixbus TV Mixing and Mastering Tutorials on YouTube. I'm your host David and here we are with the very first Q&A video, the new format in addition to our usual content. Holy shit guys, I wasn't expecting this to get received this well. You sent so many questions and so many good ones that I might need to split the replies in two videos. I'm very happy to see you like this this much. Thank you for all the questions, thank you all for the love you're sending this way. Thank you for the support you're giving Mixbus TV. You guys are great. But let's get to the questions, shall we? First one, Alex Floyd. Hi, David. I want to refer you with technical question this time. In one of your previous videos, you said you're making 300 mixes a year. Do you have a good enough rest? I mean, we all love music here, but we need some time off for shape or focus on our craft. I'm worrying. Well, first of all, thank you, Alex, for, for being concerned about me. And to answer your question, the truth is no, I don't have good enough rest. Um, I'm not complaining. Being overbooked as I am, is I'm lucky. But yeah, mixing almost 300 songs a year means that that's pretty much all I do. Um, uh, it takes over everything. I don't want to have a social life. And um, but but there are there are moments in your life when you have to decide what to do. This is for me a moment in which I need to keep my head down and just work as much as I can. Is that healthy? No, probably not. Um, but yeah, that's how it, this profession works. Um, you need to be ready when the occasions present themselves. It's stressful at times. I'll admit that, but. Um, it's also my passion. And I think one of the best thing you can achieve is to be able to make your passion your job, because that way we can say you never work a day in your life. But the truth is, yes, it's pretty stressful at times. Thank you, Alex, for your question. Second question, Jolion Cox. Thanks, David. How do you know when you're over compressed a vocal? What are some signs to listen for and how do you like to judge how much insert or parallel compression is enough? I always seem to struggle with too much artifact when compressing vocal heavily. Any thoughts? Appreciate it. Cheer for the excellent channel. Thank you, Jolion, for the question. What are the signs? Well, the signs could be a lot of things. Um, the, the vocal sound to sound speedy, for example. That's usually when you have, you know, the release a little too fast or you know too much compression going on the top end start to sound choked that's another sign that you're probably over compressing it and distortion but really it depends on the material it depends on the song because sometimes we want that over compressed sound on a rock track on a vocal on a rock track we actually usually are after that overcompressed aggressive sound on a female vocal ballad you know that the sound of the compression is not something we usually want to hear so how can we contain the dynamic and not overcompress well we use automation simple as that you automate the track before compressing it or after but usually for this purpose you want to automate before so you can control the dynamic in the most transparent way that's it it's that simple you automate levels and then you compress, you know, as little as you as you can get away with. As for insert and parallel compression, again, if you want to keep the vocal as transparent as possible, if you want less compression artifacts, what you do is you keep the insert compression to a minimum, one, two dB on the highest peak, and you use the parallel compression to add you know, density and, and thickness. When the parallel compression is enough, well, you bring it up and when you start to hear, you know, the artifacts, like I said before, maybe S's and T's and hard consonants start to get aggressive, that's when you back it off. But again, it's all about the context. And thinking that way, you can use a transparent compressor, but when you compress a vocal heavily is because you want to hear the compression. You can't compress a vocal heavily and, you know, not having artifacts. You can attenuate the artifacts by automating, so compressing less, or in some cases splitting the work of the compression between two compressors in series. So instead of having one compressor doing 10 dB of gain reduction, you split the work and you have a first compressor doing five and a second one doing another five. Third question, my friend Kark Pazu. 
Got a question, David. Can you use a normal patch bay to route amps to cabs? Of course, we're turning off amps while switching, turning them back on once connected. Uh, no, absolutely not. To the best of my knowledge, you run the risk to fry shit. You need one of those splitter pedals or the, how is it called? Um, the MW1 from Creation Audio Labs, which is technically what you're asking. A patch bay that allows you to to switch between amps and cabs. So no, don't use a regular patch bay for that, my friend. Thank you for the question. Fourth question, Daniel Davis. I produce music with plugins. Should I print my MIDI sounds to audio and mix from there? If so, why? Thank you for the question, Daniel. Um, keep in mind that I only mix, so I always receive audio uh, in my in my projects. Uh, I never have um, VST opened. And my advice is this. My advice is to print your audio for two reasons. One, because your project is going to be heavy for any computer to, to, to run if you have a lot of virtual instruments open. And remember, virtual instruments hit the RAM hard and your hard drives. So the whole session, it, it becomes slower. So that's one reason. The second reason is commit. Um, before mixing, commit to the sound that you want to use so you don't have uh, too many variables. Oh, what if, I, what if I change that sound? What if I change that other sounds? What if I tweak that parameter? Once you found your sounds on your VSTs, just print them and, and treat them as they were real instruments recorded. So that's my advice. You can do both, but you know, by my opinion, the sessions are lighter, easier to work. You can go back if you want, but you can't, you know, right in the session you have to reopen the VSD and, and, and everything. So when you commit to a sound, in my opinion, you're already a step ahead in, 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 in the process of, of, of mixing. So yeah, my advice is print. Thank you, Daniel, for the question. Question number five, Michael Silver, how to use dynamic EQ workflow. Um, thank you for the question, Michael. Um, it's a bit generic. I'm not sure what you mean. At what point in, in a chain of plugins do I use Dynamic EQ? If that's the question, usually is after my first filtering and corrective EQ. At that point, if I have, for example, wildly dynamic vocals or bass, that's when I open a Dynamic EQ. Uh, it's the first processing for me after the first basic uh, corrective EQ. Another scenario is usually at the end of a chain. For example, on the drum group, if the overall sound of the drum is fine, but you know maybe the hi hat in some places is a little too shrill, and then I'll use a dynamic EQ, most likely like a deesser. Uh, to tame that, or there's a, a spot where toms and kick play together, then the low mid needs to get controlled. So that would be another another scenario. Hope this answered the question. Thank you, Michael. Question number six, this is a multi-question. Chad Williamson, okay, one at a time. Do I start with a flat mix level and panning effects to bus top-down processing? I start to mix with a template, but it's not the kind of template that uh, most people think probably. When I open my template, what I have is usually my output groups already routed to my hardware. So that's my starting point. Uh, so I have, for example, drum bus, bass, vocals, guitars, music, synths, background vocals, and the two bus. In these output groups, I already have the hardware that I usually use as an insert in those groups. For example, for the past year, the drummer 1978 is on the drum bus, um, a distressor is on the bass, a distressor is on the vocal, an expressor from Elysia is on the stereo vocals. So I have my hardware set up already. I don't have single tracks. And um, my two bus, yes, absolutely. I start every mix with my two bus processing in place. Then I start with levels on kick and snare. That's what gives me my first gain staging for overall levels. And I build around kick and snare, the gain staging. As for effects, I have uh, at least eight to 10 effects chains that I usually keep open in the mix. So when I open the template, I have those sends for, you know, some delay, some reverbs and, and stuff like that in place already. 
Will I use them or not? I don't know, but they are there if I need them. And absolutely, I mix into my two bus uh, processing from the get go. Second part of the question, do you do your own masters and what that process look like? And do you feel a guy can still make impartial decisions when mastering their own material? Yes, nine times out of 10, I'm asked to master my own mixes. And that's easy for me because if you saw any of uh, the mastering examples videos that we have on the channels, we have we have a couple. Uh, it's not for me. Mastering is really about minor changes and bring the track to the level. Because when I finish a mix, I don't leave anything to the mastering. I don't delegate anything to the mastering process. A mix is finished for me when it sounds like you know I want it to sound. I don't delegate anything to to the mastering. I don't I don't leave oh the top end I will take care in mastering or I will have the master engineer take care of that or the low end. No, no no no. The mix doesn't leave my room until I'm 100% satisfied. Then the next day with fresh ears you might need to adjust things just because you're bringing the track to commercial level and you know limiting and clipping has an effect on the sound so you might have to rebalance things but for me it's just minor minor adjustments and in some cases a little bit of enhancing when when there's room sometimes you know you're tired and you finish a mix and the next day you listen to it with fresh ears and you realize okay it can be a little bit wider or can I have a little more balls you know in the low end and stuff like that but for me mastering is really minor minor uh, adjustments and rebalancing one song to another in the context of an album. As for making impartial decision, that's hard. Takes a lot of experience to be impartial and to be objective when mastering your own stuff. And uh, referencing it helps a lot. Hope this answered your question, Chad. And that's a wrap. This is it for this video. You sent so many good questions, guys, that we need to split the replies in two videos. So I'll see you in part two. But thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Please keep supporting Mixbuzz TV by sharing the videos and spreading the word on blogs, forums, social media. Subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time.